So hi everyone, my name is Rand. I'm the CEO here at Zama, uh, and Pascal is also the call, uh, our CTO. Um, so for those of you who are new to the meetup, FHE.org is an independent uh, organization that is about promoting homomorphic encryption and helping people understand how they can use it, how things work. Uh, so it has nothing to do specifically with Zama. It just turns out that we are you know, a contributor to it. Um, and we like to have people talk about anything in homomorphic encryption, uh, no matter what technology they're using. Uh, so we hold those meetups on a monthly basis. If you have a good idea of a talk you'd like to present, feel free to reach out uh, and propose your talk. Um, so today we have a talk on Enthru from Hilder, who's going to be uh, introducing the scheme as well as uh, giving some insights on the new constructions. Um, so the floor is yours. Oh, by the way, if you have questions, Thank you. put them in the chat. And at the end of the presentation, uh, we'll have a Q&A session. Thank you. Uh, just share my screen here. OK, I hope you can see my slides. Yeah, go ahead. OK. So hello, everybody. My name is Ilder Vitor Lima Pereira. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at COSIC KU Leuven in Belgium. And I will talk, I will give this talk FHE based on the entry problem and talk about some challenges and new constructions. So I will start with a brief introduction about FHE and those these two problems. And then I'll talk about some challenges that we have when we try to construct FHE based on the entry problem. And finally, talk about um, new constructions, which are essentially some uh, results that we have in a new paper that will be presented in Asia Crypt this year. And finally, the conclusion. OK, so um, as you may already know, there is a general framework to construct FHE, right? So basically, all the FHE schemes that exist right now, they work more or less the same way. When we want to encrypt some message, what we do is we take the secret key and we compute some term that depends on the key, right? So for example, we sample a random value and we multiply by the key. So we have this key dependent term here. And then we add some noise to it because otherwise it would be too easy to recover the key, right, from this term. And we add the message to all of this and we perform all these operations modulo some integer Q, which is usually called the ciphertext uh, modulus. And if we want to decrypt, well, we just use the key to remove this term. And then we get the noise plus the message. And we somehow remove the noise from here so we get the message. right? But to remove the noise, this step requires that the noise is smaller than some bound, for example, smaller than Q over 2. And we can see that with this structure, we already have additions essentially for free, right? So if you have two cipher texts with this format, you add then, you get again a random value times the secret key, and the messages are added here. But as it's well known, the noise is also growing, right? So for the multiplication as well, the noise is also growing. So we usually FHE evaluations, uh, homework evaluations goes like this. We start with some uh, cipher text that has some noise and we have something that we call the noise budget here. We perform some operations and then the noise grows. We perform more operations and then the noise grows up to this limit that we have. So we used all the noise budgets and then what we have to do is run the bootstrap. When we run the bootstrap, we go back to here essentially, right? And then we can do this again and again, right? But this bootstrapping is very expensive. So one thing that we usually want to do is choose a large queue. If we choose a large queue, then now we have more noise budget and we can do exactly the same operations. And then we, when we finish these same operations, we still have some noise budget and then we don't need to run the bootstrapping, right? We can perform more operations if queue is big. So this is one important, uh, thing that we will see in this presentation. We have an interest in choosing a big queue, right? Okay, and 
we can instantiate this general framework with several different um, hard problems. In particular, if we use the RLWE problem, then we have already several well-known schemes like BGV, FV, CKKS, GSW, TFHE, FU, and so on, right? And also, people have already tried to use the entry problem to construct FHE. And actually, uh, at the time, Yash was pretty efficient, right? So there is this paper by Le Poin and Ehring from 2014. And they say, we will be, we, this is the result of their practical experiments, right? So they say, we will be thinking that Yash is, as expected, faster than FV. So why was Yash faster than FV? And moreover, why were they expecting it to be faster than FV? So this is one thing that we are going to see now. Uh, but if you think about it now, if I ask you about any FHE schemes, probably many of you have never heard about this, right? But most of you will know these schemes here in this column, right? And what is the reason uh, for this? Well, to understand this, we have to understand these two problems. So. To define them, we first have to fix a ring, right? So let's fix a polynomial ring R that has this form. It's essentially a set of polynomials with degree is smaller than n, right? Degree bound, bounded by, by n. So the RLW problem then is defined like this. We sample random uh, secret S, and once we sample it, we fix it, okay? So we sample it just one time, right? And we can use this same S to produce several RLWE samples. And how do we produce them is by sampling a uniform element. So this A is uniform in this ring R modulo Q. So essentially it's the same ring here, but with integers modulo Q now. And then we sample a small noise term. Usually it's, this is just a polynomial with coefficients usually following a discrete Gaussian distribution. And then we multiply this uniform term by the secret and add the noise. So this gives us this term B. And what the RWE assumption says is that this pair of polynomials is indistinguishable from a uniform pair of uh, polynomials of this ring R modulo Q. Okay. Now, what is the end true problem? The end true problem is actually uh, close to this, right? So we have a secret polynomial F with small coefficients. Again, we sample this at random and we fix it, and then we can generate many n true samples using the same secret, right? And how do we generate these samples? Well, we sample small noise terms G, again, maybe following a discrete Gaussian with some parameter sigma, and then we multiply by this G by the inverse of F. So the idea is that although this F has a small coefficients, when you compute the inverse mod Q, you get a polynomial with uh, big coefficients, with coefficients that look already random modulo Q. And then you multiply it by this small g, and then this looks totally random. So the, what the entry assumption says is that this product here, pi, is indistinguishable from a uniform uh, element of this ring modulo Q. Okay, so if you check, if you look at these two problems, you can see that the N2 problem is somehow more compact than the RLWE problem. So if you want to encrypt a polynomial using the RLWE, you encrypt one polynomial into two polynomials, right? If you use the N2, you encrypt one polynomial into one single polynomial. So ideally, that's something you could hope, you should use half of the memory and maybe half of the running time if we use the n true instead of the RLWE problem, right? And essentially that's why in that paper, they were saying that they were, they were expecting Yash to be faster. Okay, but, um, okay, but you have this advantage with n true, but it's still nobody is, is using this uh, n true based uh, schemes, right? Yash, for example. So why is this? The thing is, um, there are some new attacks against n true that were not considered at this time. 
So I will now explain this. This is one of the challenges that we have when we try to use Intrude to construct any um, any cryptographic scheme, right? So first, let's start by this key recovery attack. This is a very well-known attack, and it was known by the time where Yash was published. So Yash, the parameters of Yash were chosen for the scheme to be secure against this attack, okay? Now, how does this attack work is as following. Imagine that you have an intrude sample H like this with uh, G times the inverse of the secret, right? This could be simply a public key of the entry scheme or an encryption of zero, right? This is uh, simple to, to obtain. Now, if you are giving this H, you can define this set. This set is defined as pairs of polynomials such that if you multiply the first component U by H, you get the second component, right? It's just, you're just defining a set. Now you can see that clearly this secret F uh, G belongs to the set, right? If by definition of H, if you multiply uh, F here, you cancel this F. So you get G, which is the second component, right? So this F belongs to the set. Uh, and more than this, the norm of this vector is very small, right? So if you compute the Euclidean norm of this vector, it's just the square root of this sum. Now, if you suppose that each coefficient of F and G are sampled from a discrete Gaussian with parameter sigma, then this sum is close to this, right? Essentially square root of N times sigma. Now, if you know a little bit about, uh, about lattices, you will, you will know that if you have this, this is a lattice actually, then there is this thing called the Gaussian heuristic that predicts the size, the, the length of the shortest vector of a lattice of dimension two, two times N, right? So this Gaussian heuristic sa says that the shortest vector of these lattice should have this norm here, right? Two times, square root of two times N times Q. So this is much larger than, than the norm of FG. So what this means for us is that not only this FG belongs to this lattice, but most probably this FG is, this, is the shortest vector of this lattice, right? So now this key recover attack uh, is built on top of this observation. Everything that we have to do now is to define a base for these lots. This is easy. Given this H, we can just define a matrix, an integer matrix H, basically by rotating the coefficients of uh, the polynomial H and multiplying by minus one. We call this a circulant matrix. And then you have this base. And now that you have the base of the lots, how do you recover uh, short vectors in the lots? Well, you just run the BKZ, right? Essentially, you run a lattice based reduction, but in practice, just the BKZ. And now the running time of BKZ is exponential in N. So this attack takes exponential time in N. So when they constructed the ASH or other and true based schemes, they took this, this attack into account and their schemes are secure against this attack. However, if you pay attention to what I said here, the size of Q doesn't matter too much. If we increase Q, we don't have much impact on this, right? So what they did in Yash, as I said in the beginning, we want Q to be large so that we don't have to run many bootstrappings when we do the homomorphic evaluation. So what they did, they choose a very large value of Q. Uh, they instantiated their scheme with a very large Q. And it turns out that there are new attacks. We didn't know at the time, but now we know that are that we can run against any true when we use a very large Q. So these are now called sublats attacks because they rely on the existence of some special sublats on these lats here that I just presented, right? So uh, the way this attack works is as follows. So the first observation is that not only this vector FG belongs to these lats, but actually you can take any combinations of this vector and they still belong to these lots, right? But if you have any combination of this vector, 
then what you have is actually a LUTs generated by this vector. Now, this LUTs L here, generated by this vector, is a sub LUTs of this, uh, the original, the full LUTs, let's say, right? And because it's generated by these two polynomials, we can actually define this base doing the same. We take F and take the circulant or uncirculant matrix of F and of G, and now we have this base B, which is a, a base of L. We can define this B, but of course we cannot construct this B because we don't know F and G, right? But the goal of this attack is using this full lots that we can construct, we want to recover some information about B, right? That's, that's what this attack tries to do. And what it exploits is this observation. Like, uh, let's try to see what is the volume of these LUTs, right? So our first rough estimation that we can do is just multiply the Euclidean norm of each column of this matrix B. Again, if we suppose that F and G follow discrete Gaussian with parameter sigma, when we compute this product, you will have this estimation for the volume, volume of L, okay? There are better ways of estimating, but for this presentation, this is fine, just for an intuition. Now, the main observation is, if this H here was a uniform um, polynomial, then N sublats of these uh, lots, N sublats of dimension N would have uh, volume around Q to the power of N over two, right? But if H is not an uniform element, it's actually a product of this uh, G times the inverse of F, we have one sublats with this very small volume. So if you remember the N true assumption is saying that it, we cannot distinguish between H being uniform and H being a product of these two polynomials, right? But now we have a condition here to distinguish between these two cases. So we can define this gap if we, if we divide the volume of what we expect to be the, uh, sorry, if we, if we divide what we expect to be the volume of the sublatses by what we know actually is the volume of the, this particular sublats, right? So now we have this metric, let's say we have a gap between what we would expect for a uniform case and what we actually have for the n true case, right? So as Q increases, this gap becomes bigger, larger, and then it becomes actually easier for the BKZ to find vectors that belong to the sublats, okay? And how does the BKZ works is as follows. The BKZ has a parameter beta, which controls the block size. It's not very important for now, but what we have to know is if you want BKZ to recover shorter vectors, we have to increase beta, right? But the running time of BKZ is exponential in beta. So if you want BKZ to recover very short uh, vectors, we have to pay more because we increase beta and then it's exponential in beta, right? But now what I'm saying is that if this, if imagine this N and sigma are fixed and you are just increasing Q, so this gap is increasing and then it becomes easier for BKZ to find short vectors in the sublats. This means that you can actually use a smaller beta, right? Because if it's easier for BKZ already, you can use a smaller beta. And then the, what this means at the end is that if as this gap increases, uh, running BKZ to recover vectors of the sublats becomes easier and easier, right? So we have something like this. Imagine that this Q is linear in N. The original N true encryption schemes, they used something like this, right? Q was very small, close to N. Then if you put like N here, you can see that this gap is essentially one, right? But if we, if we use a small polynomial uh, here, then this gap is still small. So this beta that you have to use is still linear in N and then the running time of your attack is still exponential in N. But 
as you increase uh, as you increase q, for example, if you increase it too much and use q exponential large in n, then this gap became so big that you just have to use beta uh, as a logarithmic of n, right? And two, so if you imagine two to the power of uh, two to the power of this uh, is actually polynomial in n, right? So if you use, this is what happened to Yash actually. They used the Q so large that then to break Yash, we could run a polynomial time algorithm instead of an exponential time algorithm. And then, you know, polynomial time attack, your scheme is broken. So nowadays we know, right? This is what we have to care about. We have this, essentially these two main attacks against and true. So we have key recovery attacks, which are, I will call just KR here. They are exponential in N and we have sublats attacks, right? And then what we have is essentially this. If you choose Q linear in N, then the sublats attack is basically more expensive than the Q recovery attack. And then this Q recovery attack is already exponential, uh, expo exponential time. So everything is exponential time. The N true is hard to solve and you are fine. But if you start to increase Q, then the sublats attack becomes easier and easier. And then at some point it will cost the same as the key recovery attack, right? And this point is essentially what we call the fatigue point, okay? And if you keep increasing Q anyway, you really want to use a large Q, then the sublats attack starts to become cheap and cheap, much cheaper than the key recovery attack. And then uh, the entry problem becomes easy, okay? so. Thanks to new results, uh, especially this one by Duke and Vorder, we now know that this fatigue point is essentially n to the power of two and a half, let's say, right? Close to two and a half. So if we want to build any scheme on top of n true, we have to take care of this. We have to choose our parameters in this, in this region here. This is like a standard region. If you choose your parameters in this region, then you are entering this overstretched uh, region. And then uh, you are using easier instances of n true, and it will not be good for the security of your scheme, right? So we really want to stay in this region here. This means that you have a very big limitation when we use n true, right? We have to use, we have to restrict ourselves to this small value of Q, okay? So this is the first thing to remember. We have to stay below or close to the fatigue point when we instantiate anything using and true. So this is the first challenge, but actually there are more things. If uh, the This was about security, but there is also something about uh, functionality, let's say, somehow the RLWE problem looks more flexible than the end true. And I think this is due to the fact that this term A that we have in the RLWE is somehow a redundant uh, information, right? So it's present, in, it's present in B and we have access to it. In the end true problem, we have G divided by F and we don't have access to G. So just to illustrate what I mean by being more flexible. Consider this BGV scheme. So an encryption of uh, value M is a pair of polynomials where the polynomial B has this form, right? A times the secret plus two times the noise plus the message. Now, if how do we uh, compute the product of two ciphertexts? Well, we compute the tensor product of them. So the tensor product of two pairs give us four elements, but there's a trick. We can group two of these elements. So we end up with three elements instead of uh, four. And now B has this form here. So we have A times S plus two times the noise plus the message. This, this just looks like a normal ciphertext, but we also have this uh, other strange term here, right? A prime times uh, S squared. And 
the ciphertext has three terms. So we want the result of a multiplication to have the same format as an input ciphertext, right? So that things compose and we can multiply again and again, right? We don't want the format to keep changing like this. So we have to somehow fix the form, the formats here. Okay, so if we stretch really a lot the definition of an encryption, you can think that if you just consider these two terms here and don't care, don't care about a prime, what you have is an encryption. So this looks like a normal encryption, right? An encryption of M plus this A prime times S square, right? Then what you really have to do to have an encryption of M that you want is to remove this term here, right? This is what you want to do. So how do you do this now? Well, what you need now is what we call a relinearization key. So this is an, you can see this as an encryption of S square. And what you can do is take this A prime here, you can multiply it by this encryption, this key. So you get A prime times S square. Also you can multiply by minus one, right? So that's fine. And now what you get is an encryption of minus this term, right? So if you have an encryption of these and an encryption of minus these, you can just add them. And if you add, this will be canceled out and you get an encryption of M. This is how this relinearization works in BGV, right, in a high level. But what I wanna show here is that if you say that this E term here is bounded by some term V and that the noise of the key is bounded by some VK, then when we multiply the key, we increase this VK here. We multiply this VK by some term here, right? So we get some VK prime. But when we add these two, we are just adding the original noise V that we had plus this VK prime here, right? So we are never changing this term V, right? That's, that's what I wanna show. Now, if you try to do the same, with n true, you will see that we cannot have this expression for the noise anymore, that this v will also change. So let's just say that we are trying to construct bgv based on n true, right? So encryption of m would have maybe this form, two times uh, g divided by f, two times some noise plus the message. And then we would do the same, compute this, x, this uh, tensor product, when we do this, now we get, instead of F, we get F square here. So this is what starts to bother us, right? And then something divided by F and some noise, right? So again, this part here looks like a normal ciphertext, let's say, right? It looks like this. So we can say that what we obtained is essentially an encryption of M plus this thing here that we have to remove. But how can we remove it now? In the case of the RLWE, we could simply take this, this was an A, right? We could simply take it, multiply by the key and subtract from here. But now we don't know G, so we cannot do the same. What we can do now is to multiply this C by a value F. You see that if we multiply this by F, this square will disappear this F will disappear, so we get just the noise, and these will be multiplied by F, but it's okay because this will just be another noise term, right? So this is what we have to do now. And then how can we do this? Well, we again, we define a key, which is an encryption of F essentially. And then we multiply this uh, key by C, right? So as I explained, this square disappears, we have just F here this F disappears and this term is multiplied by F, but this is okay. This is just a new term E. So we have again, something of this form, right? But what happens to the noise now? If you, again, we say that this noise term is bounded by V, then in the final expression, we have E times F. And the size of this is around the square root of N times V, right? So the final noise that we get is again, when we multiply the key by C, we increase the noise that we had in the key. So we have this 
times the noise of the key. And we also increase the noise of the ciphertext, right? So you can see that this is worse than for the RLWE scheme. So just to try to show things in a graphical way, right? So if you have a ciphertext using RLWE, if you have a ciphertext that has some term that depends on the key, this could be the result of a rotation when you apply an automorphism in BGV or CKKS, for example, right? You get a ciphertext that includes some term that depends on a function of the key. And then you want to remove this. So for example, when you want to apply a key switching, then you need some key that encrypts this uh, function of the key that we had there. But usually this key has a very small noise. What we do, you multiply the key by this value and then you increase a little the noise of the key and you add this C prime to the original C. So what you are doing is adding this noise to this noise here, but this is very close to the original noise that you had, right? So these two are essentially the same. So this uh, procedure is not really increasing the noise. It's essentially the same output that we had, right? But if you try to do the same with N true, now you had the key with very small noise, you increase the noise of the key, but you also increase the noise of the ciphertext. And then the addition of them is larger than the original noise that you had. So this is why I'm saying that the RLWE looks more flexible. You, if you try to build things using N true, you will see that you come up, that you have to face this problem a lot of times. If you try to build a multi-key version of FHE using N true, you will also have this problem. Okay, so essentially we have these when we compare these two problems, right? The N true is more compact, so it should allow you to save memory and time. On the other hand, the RLWE supports, uh, you are more free to choose the parameters when you use RLWE, and also the RLWE looks more flexible, okay? Because of this, um, this extra term A that is there, it allows you to do, it seems at least to allow you to do more things, right? Okay, so now that we understand some of the challenges that we have when we try to use and true, I will talk about some new constructions, right? So given all these limitations, are we still able to gain something when we use the end true, right? Uh, so if you try to build schemes that look like BGV or CKKS using and true, this looks very hard because these schemes usually uh, require us to choose a large queue and then we are already in the overstretched regime. So the option that we have is to try to use the blueprint of FIU and TFHE. Okay, because these schemes require us to choose a very small queue. So this is what we do. We did in this paper, which is called Final, Faster FHE Instantiated with N2 and LWE. And uh, this paper is was accepted to Asia Crypt this year, but it's already available on ePrint, right? So if you just type the name on Google, you'll easily find the PDF. Okay, so what did you do on this paper? We propose a new uh, scheme that looks like GSW. We call it this scheme NGS, N true based GSW like scheme. And then because N true is a more compact, we have a faster external product at the end when with this NGS. And then we use this NGS to bootstrap a scheme that is based on N true. So both here are based on N true. This means that we obtained FHE based only on the N true assumption and with parameters uh, like with a small Q. So Q is essential N times some polylogarithmic term in N. So it's below the fatigue point asymptotically, right? And we also use this NGS to bootstrap in let's say normal or more common LW based scheme. And 
when we used these, so we had to use both uh, assumptions, LWE and then true, but our scheme uh, has a bootstrapping that runs 28% uh, faster than TFHS bootstrapping. And also we use almost half of the key size of TFHG. Okay, so how did we do this? Well, first of all, we constructed this NGS scheme. And this NGS scheme works like this. We have a secret key, which is just a small polynomial. So this is just the secret of the N true scheme. And then we have two types of ciphertext, a scalar and a vector ciphertext. The scalar ciphertext is just like this. You just sample one n true sample, right? So G times the inverse of F. And then you add the message times some scaling factors. This is just an integer, right? Like Q over two or Q over four, right? And this is your scalar ciphertext. So you can see that we are encrypting a message into a single polynomial, right? Instead of into po two polynomials. And we have a vector ciphertext, which is con constructed like this. Imagine that you just sample many of these n true um, samples. So you have several GIs here. You group them into a vector. So what you will be taking is a vector G divided by the same, all the entries divided by the same F, right? So this is just a vector of n true samples. And instead of multiplying the message by some scaling, integer scaling factor, you multiply the message by this uh, vector. So you choose some base B and you compute all the powers of B all the way to Q, right? So L is just log of Q. So for those who are familiar with TFHE or FI or GSW scheme, this is just a vector, uh, gadget vector. This corresponds to the gadget matrix that we have in TFHE. So the ciphertext is in TFHE, uh, have this message M multiplied by a matrix with this form. So in this matrix, this vector appears two times padded by zeros, right? So we can see that the the compactness of n true is paying off, right? To have a vector instead of a, a matrix. And because of this, the external products become cheaper. So to run an external product, we just have to take this scalar ciphertext uh, C, decompose it. So we get a vector Y with L components. And then we just have to run a dot product, multiply this Y by the vector uh, ciphertext C, right? So the cost of this is just L multiplications on RQ. So if we compare this with uh, the normal, let's say the RLW-based GSW, uh, what we have is like this. We have that the scalar ciphertext in our case is just one polynomial instead of two. The full ciphertext in our case is a vector ciphertext. So it's log of Q polynomials. In the GSW, it's four times L polynomials and the external product in our case costs L multiplications and in the GSW costs four times L. So these are the constant factors that we hope we can gain if we use NGS instead of GSW. If we can set the parameters of GS of NGS such that L is the same here and here, right? Then we are really gaining these factors, but it's not easy to do this. So. Okay, but this is the main idea. Those are the constant factors that we can gain. So let's take a look up on the uh, bootstrapping of TFHE. How does it work? We start with an LW encryption of some message M with large noise E. Then we use the GSW uh, encryption, uh, sorry, uh, GSW uh, scheme to evaluate a main loop, so with external products. So TFHE calls this uh, blind rotation, right? This is step. So essentially you take this LWE and you are multiplying it by uh, one component by S and subtracting from B, right? So the output of this step is an encryption of this power of X, right? You essentially have a power of X, the noise is now here in the exponent 
and the message is here, right? But this is our RLW encryption. And then there is a step where you extract this M from the, the exponent, you put it in the coefficient. And in this step, you also remove this term E here. So what you get doesn't depend on E anymore, right? So you have this extraction and also you run a key switching so that the, the final cipher text is again an LW encryption, uh, has the same format as the input, right? It's an LW encryption of M, but now with a much smaller noise E prime instead of the original E. Okay, so what about if you try to do this using NGS? Well, NGS can execute external products, so we can run this main loop. This is okay, but the output will be an encryption of this, uh, the same message, the same power of X, but encrypted under N true instead of RLWE, right? And because it's encrypted under N true, uh, this next step, extraction and key switching are missing. We don't have them for N true. So we have to come up with this, uh, this step. We have to define it. And also, if you want everything to be based on true, then we need a new true based scheme to start with instead of the LWE. So we did this in the paper. We propose a new, um, is new scheme here based on the true to replace this LWE one. So just like in the TFHE uh, framework, you have RLWE and you have LWE. One is over the ring, another one is over the integers. For the N true, you have kind of the same. You have N true itself, which is over rings, and you have M and true, which is a generalization uh, over the integers. So the M and true says that this matrix, instead of having a polynomial G and the inverse of a polynomial F, now we have a matrix G and the inverse of a matrix F. And if you multiply them, you get a matrix that is indistinguishable from uniform mod Q. Okay, so we can use this uh, to build the base scheme that we want to bootstrap, right? But we don't want exactly this format because then to decrypt, you have to multiply by one matrix F, this will be too costly. So what we do, we just consider the first row of C. So if you check this, actually the first row of C is equal to the first row of this matrix G times the inverse of F, right? So because this is just a row, this means that the ciphertext now is just one vector of dimension N instead of a matrix N by N, right? And now to decrypt, we don't want to multiply by F. We want the decryption to be simple. So we define this vector F here to be just the first column of F. And then to decrypt, you just have to multiply this vector by f. So this is just a dot product. So this we can compute easily using the external products, right? So we we can use the external products of NGS to compute this. So what we get is an encryption of uh, x to the power of this. Uh, this is almost the decryption already, right? So. This means that we can start with an encryption of some message under this uh, small f. And after n external products, we end up with an encryption of this power of x as before with some, the noise that we had here is now here, plus the scale of the message, right? And then we can extract it m from the exponent to the coefficient, this is essentially the same as in TFHE. And now uh, we, we have a new key switching for N true ciphertexts so that we can switch from this secret F to the original secret F that we had here. And also the dimension from capital N to this uh, lowercase N here. So after the key switching, we have an encryption of the same message under the original um, secret as we wanted to have. Right? So 
when we put all of this together, we have a FHE scheme based only on the entry problem and it uses a small Q. So all the parameters are below the fatigue point, right? Essentially we can use Q as N times some polylogarithmic factor, which is asymptotically smaller than, than this uh, N to the two and a half, right? So what we obtain at the end is this. Now we can start with an entry encryption of M with some large noise. Then we have this uh, main loop using external products. This is like the blind rotation, right? We evaluate all of this with our NGS. And what we get is a power of, an encryption of a power of X under the N true. And then we run the extraction and the key switching and we get back an N true encryption of M, the same message, but now with a smaller noise. So this means we really bootstrapped the, we refreshed the ciphertext as we wanted to do. Okay, so we also used our NGS uh, scheme to bootstrap a LWE uh, ciphertext. So here, if we start with LWE and we end up with LWE, okay? So how do we do this? So we start with a ciphertext LW encryption. So as usual, it has this format right, a random, uh, uniformly random vector A and the term B, which is A times S plus some noise, just an integer, right, and the message. And now we can already use the NGS external products to compute an encryption of X of this power B is public. So we can already define X to the B to start with. And uh, we use the bootstrapping keys, right, which encrypt S, and then what we get at the end using all these external products is an encryption of this power of X, so X to the power of B minus A times S, right, so if you subtract A times S here, what we get is E plus uh, the scaled message in the exponent as before, right, this is exactly what we wanted. So what we are doing so far is, is this, we are starting with a LWE encryption of M with large noise. We have this main loop and we get an encryption of this power of X under the N true, right? So we, we are still missing the extraction and the extraction will give us an N true encryption of M, right? But we want an LWE encryption at the end, not an uh, N true encryption. So we are missing this extraction and we are also missing somehow this transformation from N true to LWE. So in our, in our paper, we propose a new key switching from N true to LWE. And with this new key switching, we can close this gap and then we have this full loop, right? We can start with LWE encryption. Uh, we get this N true encryption. We extract M from the exponent to the coefficient, run this N true to LWE key switching, and then we are back to LWE, right? So this is how we obtain this. Uh, this is how we use the NGS to bootstrap a scheme based on the LWE. So this means that we are using both assumptions, right? LWE and N true assumption. Okay, so uh, we also implemented all of this in C++ and actually the code is, is public. You can go to this GitHub repository and download it and play with it. And we compared uh, our schemes with TFHE. So for uh, for the for our schemes we have we chose these parameters so this n capital n is the degree of the polynomials that we are working with and so this is also the dimension of the entities that we have to to run when we want to multiply these polynomials right so this is the same as in tfhe 2 to the 10 but then we have two basic schemes right we have one based on the n true 
and another one based on the LWE. So the one based in Intru has dimension 800 and the, the other one dimension about 600. And this dimension N, small N here, uh, lowercase N, is actually the number of external products that we have to run. So what's happening is that when we use NGS to bootstrap M and true, we have to run more external products. So as we see in this table, this means that bootstrapping M and true is more expensive. So when we compared our results with the FHE, this is what we got. If you want to bootstrap uh, entry scheme, we need essentially the same number of FFTs as TFHE needs, but we need much more multiplications on uh, RQ, so pointwise multiplications. And then this means that our bootstrapping is actually slower than TFHE bootstrapping. But when you use both assumptions, LWE and then true, so we are using the NGS uh, and true based scheme to bootstrap LWE, we need much less FFTs than uh, TFHE. And then our running time becomes uh, is, is smaller. We run faster than, than TFHE. Right? And also if you compare this, the key size, we have 40 against 26 and 31 against 13. So our, the total key size in our case is about half of the key size of TFHE, right? And our running time in this case is about 28% faster than in TFHE. Okay, so uh, in this presentation, I have presented some of the challenges that are involved when you try to construct anything based on, on N true, but especially when you try to construct homomorphic encryption with schemes or homomorphic FHE related stuff because there is always a pressure to increase Q so that you have more noise budget, right? And then uh, uh, we also saw a scheme that is based with N true, only on N true, an FHE scheme based on N true with parameters there are in the standard regime, let's say, not in this overstretched regime. And we hope that this scheme will bring uh, more attention of the academic community. And then uh, maybe people will improve this scheme and maybe this running time that we have here will be reduced. Who knows, maybe to get this, it will be the same or even faster than uh, what we have for TFHE, right? And we also presented this, this NGS, which is just like a GSW uh, scheme, but based on the true, and then it's more compact. And we hope that maybe this NGS scheme can be used in other applications. So other applications that are already using GSW maybe can replace it by NGS and have a faster application. And well, we also presented this uh, N true to LWE uh, key switching, and we showed how to use it in, in our bootstrapping. And then with this, we obtained a, a new fast and fast bootstrapping with very small uh, key size. Okay, that's all. If you have any questions or comment, this is the time. So I might start with one question first, which is that for the Dukal von Morden paper, the entry deep point paper that you cited, uh, it looks like at least in the presentation that you cited a form of the fatigue point, like computation as an asymptotic result. But this paper also includes an explicit expression for what Dukal von Morden believed the fatigue point for entry to be. It's like, a, it is linear, uh, sorry, it's like n to the 2.4 something uh, as you have, but there's also this like very small uh, constant factor. It's like. 0 0.004 or something. Uh, is this yes. taken into account for your concrete implementation? Yes, yes, yes. It's not not exactly exactly that bound because that one is using 
the sigma, the uh, district Gaussian parameter, uh, mm -hmm. is smaller than what we are using. But uh, what we did is we took the scripts that they used to. Uh, so in this paper, right, by Duca, they have some scripts that they used to to estimate the concrete hardness of n true, taking into account these uh, sublats attacks. So we asymptotically we know that we are below, but of course concretely we have to check. So we we had to use these scripts together with the, um, the standard uh, lattice-based estimator to get concrete um, security level, right? So this is what we did. Okay, cool, thanks. You're welcome. I think you have a question from Faker uh, in the chat, Builder, if you can check. Yes, uh, okay, so I Thank you. If you're still here, you can jump in. Up to you. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so I guess you can read the question from yes. the chat, or if you want me to give some more <laughs> explanations. The question. Ah, uh, yes. I saw your question. Well, so we tried to uh, be careful to have a. A fair comparison with the FHE, right? We understand that this is complicated. Uh, and the FHE is the state of the art. So if you claim that you have something that is faster, you should be very, 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 very careful, right? So yeah, we tried to pay attention to this, right? We we just compared it with the let's say original TFHE implementation, which just use binary uh, messages. So you have just one bit, you know, this original one where you encrypt one bit per ciphertext to run one homomorphic binary gate, and then you run the bootstrapping. So we implemented exactly the same with our scheme. Also, uh, the FFTs, as I said, we are using the same dimension, right? So this, the, degree of the polynomial ring is 2 to the 10 in our case and also in the TFHE. Uh, what else? We used the same FFT library in, in our implementation and also in the TFHE implementation. Uh, yeah, well, we even, use it, we even used the same compilation flags as in, in TFHE. Yeah, okay, so maybe security-wise, if you use the same parameters, could you compare if the estimated security would be the same if you're using the same uh, polynomial degree, for example? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so what we did, we used these scripts to get this. Um, so this is a like a standard way of estimating the security of these LATS-based uh, encryption, LATS-based uh, schemes, right? Any scheme, actually even if it's not about encryption. Any scheme based in lots is essentially what you do is you try to estimate the block size that you have to use in BKZ to break your scheme, right? So okay. we did this. And after you have this block size beta, you have some cost models of how you translate this beta into the actual uh, bit security level, right? So we could extract this beta, and then we use exactly the same cost model as TFHE is using. So we get 128 bits of security as they get, but more of this, our 128 bits of security is comparable with their 120 bits of security. I don't know if this is Yeah, clear. I see, because, yeah, because there was also the parameter beta, which is, uh, which if I remember correctly, is not in TFHE. So in, in this point of view, you also need to compare, uh, yeah, because you have more parameters, basically. Yeah, no, no, but uh, they do the same, right? You have the param you have the RLWE parameters. That's how you define your hardness assumption, right? But but to know how hard this RLWE is, essentially, you have to see how much time BKZ takes to break this. Uh, this is ah, essentially see. what you do in practice, and then. Mm -hmm. When you talk about BKZ, you talk about this uh, block size beta, right? 
Yeah, no, 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 I see. Okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe it's a bit more high level question. Uh, is uh, the scheme you propose somehow equivalent to TFHC so that it could be like replaced in one step in the future? Is, yeah, I mean, yeah, from it, the functionality point of view. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for binary messages, if you want to run uh, binary circuits, which is what the original uh, TFHC does, yes, this is true. Right now, for follow-up works like the concrete, they use larger messages with more bits. Then we don't have this functionality in final yet, right? We have to extend final uh, to uh, to handle larger messages, and then we will see what what we have, right? How it behaves if it will still be faster. It is. Yeah, I mean, just, uh, just theory wise, not not implementation wise, just in the theory if this is somehow equivalent to the uh, multi value plain text space in TFHG, for example. Um, yeah, I mean, you can, of course, support more bits. Uh, it will work. It's just that if you do this, you have to increase the value of Q. Yes. Yeah, sure. and, and then increase N. And as I explained in the presentation, we have to be careful with how big Q is, right? Okay, so more comparison would need to be made for other parameters and setups. Uh, if you want to increase the the message space, right? Yeah. For binary messages, this is is really let's say out of the box. You can take your yeah. your program using TFHG and replace by a final, right? Yeah. For others, we still have to see for our larger messages, but but I mean. It's possible, of course. It's just a matter of whether this will be more efficient or not. Okay, got it, thank you. No worries, thank you for the question. Okay, I don't know if you have more questions. I don't think so. In any case, if you guys have questions, you can still ask on Discord. Um, Hilda, thank you very much for the presentation. No worries. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, of I'm, course. I'm, I'm sorry, I have a question. Go ahead, yes. of course. Yeah. Uh, do you hear me cl clearly? Yeah. Yes. OK, uh, thank you for your talk, uh, Hilda. It was uh, a very instructive talk. Um, my, my question is pretty simple. Um, as I understood uh, the, the external product in NGS, uh, is the is the multiplication of is the product between two uh, two different type of ciphertext so the vector uh, type and the scalar type uh, is NGS uh, do the product between uh, two, uh, two to to the, the the same type of ciphertext? Okay, I see. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Of course, uh, we can do this. So essentially. What you are what you are calling a product of same type is, I think TFEG calls this internal product instead of external product, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 So of course we can do this, and then it it yeah again, uh, it becomes even cheaper than than the uh, TFEG internal product because if we do this, we have to multiply one vector. By one matrix, right? And in the case of uh, the normal GSW, we have to multiply two matrices, right? So this we gain even more than when we just compare the external products. Uh, okay. We, I mean, it's just that because for the bootstrapping itself, we don't use this product, so I didn't yeah. talk about this in the presentation. But this internal product is essentially just repeating the external the external product L times, essentially. Okay. Okay. Thank you. No worries. All right. <laughs> thank you, Hilda. Guys, we'll make the recording uh, available tomorrow or on Thursday at last. Uh, and if you have questions, then please jump in on uh, on this call. Okay, thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.